All right, back at it. Um, module 6F, let's just go right into it. Here we go. All right, so we are now in the sort of middle part of chapter nine, and this is really where behaviorism starts to take steam. So just to kind of think about, you know, how how everything fits. Titchener was kind of the last person we talked about in the, in the functionalist kind of tradition, but he was already doing animal research and he was, you know, he had his little puzzle boxes, um, et cetera, those sorts of things. Uh, Pavlov came along now and, um, you know, was just doing his own thing. Pavlov wasn't trying to be a psychologist at all. He was a physiologist, as we've talked about, but he came up with this procedure and ultimately documented learning. Now that turns out to be very powerful. So other people learned about what Pavlov was doing and you know among them were the two people we'll talk about today Watson and Lashley and it was really Watson who who saw within Pavlov's approach the future um, so to speak and he became the main proponent of this new way of doing psychology that he called behaviorism uh, a way that you know was very much inspired and openly inspired by Pavlov and Betarov uh, as well um, all right so let's jump into this. Here's Mr. Suave, John B. Watson. Doesn't he look suave in that picture? Reminds me of that, I don't know, guy that's on Friends. <laughs> anyway, John B. Watson, here he is. Um, we do think of him as the father of behaviorism. Uh, I'm going to give you details in a moment, but just the general overview is, you know, he really believed that psychology had to be an experimental and applied discipline, but he was not... Um, uh, into the sort of clinical side of things per se. Um, he, but he definitely believed that the results in the lab had to have relevance to the real world. And he often kind of made that connection. Um, often in his case, in terms of parenting, and, and you'll learn a little bit about that uh, in the chapter as you read it. Uh, he defined psychology's goal as the prediction and control of behavior scary and at some level when you hear it you know when i hear things like that i, I hope psychology fails <laughs> to its extent um i don't know if we want a science that allows people to accurately predict and control human behavior all the time um sounds like it could have a dark side uh, of some sort but nonetheless uh and of course he really made psychology uh the science of behavior and and you know the the psychology he defined stood the test of time for a number of decades, really until the 1960s, when the cognitive revolution started to kick in. So there's a period of time, you know, almost from the 1920s, um, but into the 30s that goes all the way to the late 50s, where behaviorism really ruled. And yeah, Watson shone the light on that. And, and he did it primarily through um, one of the things he wrote, psychology as the behaviorist views it. Um, so again, following Pavlov, he said, hey, listen, we're going to be a real science here. And so enough of this talk about things like consciousness or introspection or even memory and attention and perception, you know, these are all things that we cannot see happening. Uh, and he didn't want to study. He considered these non-scientific. If you couldn't see it directly, then it was not worthy of scientific study. He also found functionalist psychology just too vague. Um, and, and he said there's too many cats running too many directions, doing too many things. And there's a lot of focus on the mind, right? Even in... in um, um, in, in the puzzle box work that Thorndike was doing. Did I say call him Titchener earlier? I'm, I'm worried I called him Titchener. But anyway, the, the Thorndike, when his puzzle boxes and stuff, you know, he was still trying to, he was still talking about the mind of the animal and what it was figuring out. Um, yeah, there was to be no more discussion of the mind. <laughs> it's like, forget anything like that. Instead, Watson said, we're going to focus only on observable facts a science of observable facts. And what can you observe relevant, relevant to psychology? Well, you can observe the stimulus characteristics of a situation an organism is put within. So what are the things? And you can measure their brightness, their loudness, their whatever, right? They're observable, you can measure them directly. And then what are the sort of behaviors that the organism emits in that context. And, and we assume sometimes that these behaviors are provoked by the stimulus. And so we can kind of learn what stimuli provoke which behaviors. But again, the behaviors you can measure directly, you can see directly. Um, and so he really restricted psychology to, to this, you know, we call it SR psychology sometimes now, stimulus response psychology, um, that that was what was considered scientific. 
And he thought to the extent psychology should have anything to do with consciousness, we should use consciousness the way all other scientists use it, and that's to study things not as the subject of study. Um, and so he thought, yeah, we use our consciousness to, to figure stuff out, um, but we're not going to figure consciousness out because that's just too vague. Let's figure behavior out. Let's try to understand behavior. Uh, and, and that's enough. You don't have to, you know, in, in Watson's mind, you don't have to know what's going on in the mind. If you can predict and understand behavior, the mind becomes irrelevant. Um, wow. There we go. Uh, and he was also fond, I had to throw one of these out there, just I like to get a little bit of the character. Um, he was fond of making very strong claims um, and then sometimes backing away a little bit from them, but he would he would stir the pot a little bit and throw things out there to get um, people's attention, uh, probably, and, and to get them thinking the way he thought. So this is one of his famous ones. I should like to go one step further now and say, give me a dozen healthy infants well-formed and my own specific world to bring them up in and i'll guarantee to take anyone at random and train him to become any type of specialist i might select doctor lawyer artist merchant chief and yes even beggar man and thief regardless of his talents pensions tendencies abilities vocations and race of his ancestors i am going beyond my facts and i admit it but so have advocates of the contrary, and they have been doing it for thousands of years. Please note that when this experiment is made, I am to be allowed to specify the way the children are to be brought up in the type of world they have to live in. Okay, what what is this? Um, first of all, you know, let me. Um, uh, I admit it, but so but so have the advocates. Oops, sorry, right here. But so have the advocates of the contrary. What's the contrary? What's he talking about here? This goes to the heart of nature nurture, okay? And, and it's important to understand when he says, you know, the advocates of the contrary that have been doing it for th many thousands of years, going beyond the facts for many thousands of years. The contrary he's referring to is the nature side. Um, and, you know, I don't know about the thousands of years, that, that may be an exaggeration, although who knows. Um, but certainly, you know, since, since the days of Darwin's focus on heredity, uh, and then Mendel, of course, figures out genes and how genes are transmitted, um, there was a, a huge focus on the nature side of things. Um, and we see this in the work of Galton, right? Looking at the heredity of intelligence and the heredity of other, you know, maybe personality characteristics. And so for, for many years post-Darwin, people were really focused on genetics and nature and inheriting things and, and how powerful that was, perhaps because that was a bit of a surprise to them. However, what we're going to you know, so the opposite. So what, what side is Watson on? He is on the nurture side. He is perhaps the strongest nurture arguer in the world. And if you read this now from that, what he's saying is, let's, let's go uh, right here. Regardless of his talents, penchants, tendencies, abilities, vocations, and race of his ancestors, he is saying right now, I don't care what this person's genetic endowment is. Give me anybody. The genetics don't matter. Um, I can create an environment where I turn these people into anything I want to turn them into. And so he is very strongly saying it's nurture, nurture, nurture. So, you know, you know, think about things like the eugenicists, right? The eugenics movement was sort of the height of the nature movement and, and literally saying, oh, we should prevent certain people from breeding and we'll have a better human race. Watson is, is, is really countering that sort of thing and saying, no, no, yes, there's genetics. Yes, 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 blah, blah, blah. But it's really the things that happen to us in our life that make us who we are. Uh, and so he's being very nurtured. Okay, so um, if, we, you know, if we kind of see these two things, nature and nurture, um, behaviorism is way on the nurture side. Uh, there's some things here we haven't talked about yet. We have you know, talked about some biological approaches and they're very nature, right? Because that's sort of what biology is all about. Um, but psychoanalysis too, a lot of the Freudian kind of views, um, you know, innate drives, innate tendencies, that was really focused on the nature end of things. Um, and now behaviorism is gonna go way over here. Okay, way over here, very strong nurture focus, a focus on learning. That's what Pavlov showed, learning. Learning is nurture. Right, um, and we're going to have a couple of others soon that will kind of fit in the middle a little bit. Um, but now we're on the far right, not that far right, but this far right. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so he was big on that. 
So he really wanted to show, by the way, with this, um, that that learning is real and that it can do all sorts of different things or it can come into play at different levels. So he thought the learning we experience produces the habits that stick with us the rest of our lives. These could be emotional habits. We're going to talk about little Albert in a moment. So he thought all of our emotional habits surrounded either fear, rage, or love. Um, these were the core sort of emotional reactions. Um, they could be manual habits, which is literally like learning to play guitar or learning to dance or something. Things where, you know, you, you learn muscle movements um, that allow you to achieve some, some goal. Um, they could be verbal habits, by the way. And I throw this out there because some of you who are in the clinical area know of cognitive behavior therapy, CBT, um, cognitive behavior therapy. Um, the, the behavior stuff that Watson and others have, have pushed it's, it's not that we don't believe in a lot of their findings anymore. We feel their definition of, of psychology was too restrictive, but the stuff they did study, they studied well. Um, and, and we've learned some really good things. And one of the things is people can have verbal habits that relate to, to their internal speech and their thought. And, you know, for example, a depressed person can, can fall into a, an internal bias where most of their thoughts focus on the negative things that happen to them in life. And, and very little attention or, or mind time is spent on, on the more positive things. Um, and so one of the things we will do with behavior therapy is try to right that imbalance. We will try to you know, get rid of that bias towards negativity by reshaping their habits. Uh, and so even though, you know, Watson is like, no, it's not about mind, it's not about thought, um, a lot of the ideas he had and a lot of the, the, the things they found out once we started to open up psychology again to thoughts and, and ideas, they had a place um, and they continue to have a place. You know, in fact, when, yeah, okay, let me just leave it there. All right, so let's talk about one of these in a little bit more detail. It's the most famous one. Um, so, and it really was, I think, the most important one for Watson because Watson, again, was living in this sort of shadow of the eugenics um, time, right? This is World War one and two, but especially two, sort of before two and after two. So that's when eugenics, you know, came to full fruition with Hitler. Uh, and so he was very much trying to make the point that it is not all about genetics, that our learning plays a big role. And he felt that showing that at the level of emotions, that people think of emotions as so primitive, as so core to our basic biology, let's say, that if I can show you that our emotional reactions are learned, um, then maybe I can show you guys to stop being all so excited about you know, our biology. Um, it, it's not our biology, it's our learning. So he wanted to so, show that a basic, what a lot of people thought is a basic biological response could actually reflect learning. And he did that, of course, with his um, Little Albert experiment. I've got the Little Albert experiment there. I'm gonna let you, you can just, should be able to play it right in. Uh, in here, but I know sometimes when this happens, it doesn't um, give me the the volume. Yeah, it is playing though. So I'm not gonna play it now. I'm just gonna let you watch it. Let me just give you the, the highlights. You know, what he showed um, with little Albert was he, he found this baby that first that was seemed to be afraid of almost nothing. Uh, and so he could put him in a room and you could put almost anything in the room, including critically things like white rats and rabbits and fur stalls and things like that. And the, and the baby was interested in all of them. In fact, they even show one thing in, in one of the videos where they have a burning newspaper uh, and little Albert seems a little interested in that too. It's like he will approach the burning newspaper. So he's, he's, he's a generally fearless kid to begin with, which is kind of part of the ethics of all this, right? So let, let's just go there. So then there is one thing little Albert doesn't like. Um, it's, it's something almost everybody doesn't like. Again, it's sort of like a Pavlov um, UCS, UCR pair that when they banged on a gong, they had this gong right behind little Albert that made this bang, clanging sound. Little Albert didn't like that and it made him scared. So he would cry when, when they banged that thing and it would cause him to cry. UCS, UCR kind of pairing, right? Um, now though, of course, again, Pavlov clear in his mind, um, what Watson and Rayner, who will come into play. So Rayner did a lot of this research with him. She was a graduate student of his. We will talk about her in just a moment. Um, but they together would do the following. 
Um, they would let little Albert in the room, everything would be fine, but every now and then they would introduce a white rat. And when the white rat came anywhere near Albert, they would hit the, the gong, which would make Albert afraid, right? And so they would do this over and over. Every time he approached the rat or the rat approached him, they would hit the gong, make Albert afraid, did this over and over and over, right? This is just a, a CS now. The rat is a CS, a, a conditional stimulus. Um, and Albert learns the conditional response. He learns to, to fear the rat after a while. Um, so the fear translates to the rat, you know, just as it did in the Pavlov uh, kind of situation. Um, and not only did it translate to the rat, but once they taught little Albert to fear the rat, um, they could show that he was fearful of, of rat-like things like white rabbits or even, you know, white stoles or Santa Claus, etc. So, you know, you might be thinking, what? They, they took a baby and made him scared of Santa Claus? Yes, they did. Yes, they did. Um, whatever became of Little Albert, there's a whole, you, you'll, you'll find a little bit of that in the textbook as well. There's a whole mystery about, you know, what became of Little Albert. He was originally, by the way, a baby that was part of a, he was a baby of a weaning nurse or a nurse that did some um, uh, infant work in a hospital. And so, yeah, anyway, they tracked him down or they tried to track him down. You can find the whole story. Uh, but the powerful thing, again, from Watson and Rainer's point of view, was look, we've made him scared of something. And we did that through learning, through environmental manipulation. Even fear can be conditioned. In fact, Watson claimed, maybe a lot of our emotional reactions to the world are conditioned. Therefore, parents, be careful how you raise your children because you may be making them fearful um, of things if you're not doing things right. Okay, um, strong again, sort of uh, shot over the bow of all those people that were so enamored with genetics um, and really trying to say learning matters. Okay, um, let's not let me go forward with that. There we go. Um, okay, so that I mean that was the big thing um, for for Watson, but I do, but I do want to talk about how he also kind of focused on. Um, he was interested in a number of other things. In the textbook, we'll talk uh, about a few, but I'm going to mention this one more because it connects um, with Lashley, who we'll talk about next. So serial order behaviors. Um, Pavlov, or Pavlov, uh, Watson was interested in in how things would, would change so that, you know, in language, there's a stimulus um, that leads to response, but it's followed by another stimulus. There's always a word, 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 right? And you have all these words kind of lined up, each of which, if you imagine the person reading them, would produce a word that you were reading. But he started to think that a lot of when responses occurred in chains, as they do when we're reading words, that there would be a sort of um, where the first response would kind of kick the second response. There would be a chain formed where this stimulus could just kick off that whole um, set of responses, so to speak. And so he was interested in how things became chained. Now, why was he interested in this, by the way? Because, you know, Pavlov showed, okay, well, wow, it's nice. You can make a dog drool to a bell. Great. But what about really complex sorts of behaviors where people are doing very odd things in certain situations? Well, Watson thought that occurred because they had chained some learning stuff together. And so that's what he was, he was looking at here. And he thought when you chain a bunch of things together, that initial cue can kick off a whole chain of behaviors. Um, so he was very interested in this anyway, and he really focused on speech um, as an area where that could occur. Okay, so let's just put that aside for a moment because we're going to come back to it. Um, we just have to stop. I mean, we, we, people often stop um, with, with uh, Watson. They have to tell the story. But there was a previous story of Mark Baldwin uh, in the textbook as well. And I want to kind of connect, connect both of them. And I, I do that on purpose. Mark Baldwin was one of the first psychologists at the University of Toronto. Um, he, he played a large role in the University of Toronto's early days in psychology. Um, and so Mark Baldwin, if you recall, was doing fine in his career until he until there was a raid on an african-american house of ill repute a cat house and baldwin was found inside that cat house um, and he got in trouble he lost his job he you know things got really kind of um, tough for him um, watson here 
uh, with Rosalie Rayner, the one that had done the uh, experiment with him. Watson was married, um, but all indications are he started a romantic relationship with, with Rosalie Rayner. He um, divorced his wife, or his wife divorced him. He got divorced. Uh, and the scandal was quieted for a little while, but um, it, it came out and it cost him his job. So the end of Watson as a psychologist was because he had um, had a romantic relationship with a graduate student, Rosalie Rayner, who he, who he ultimately, by the way, lived a long life with. Um, so so uh, he left his wife and he was with Rosalie. Um, but just a, a note to show how much intolerance there was at that per, that time. If, if you did something like that, that was considered you know, morally um, corrupt, for lack of a better term, there were serious consequences. Uh, and and in, in the case of uh, in this case, what we what we end up seeing is that he goes into advertising, and he, and he does actually very well. So he leaves academia totally. He becomes an advertiser, which is kind of interesting if you think of you know learning and controlling behavior, and that's his ultimate goal. Well, wow, you can really do that in consumer behavior, right? And you can try to condition people to like your products. And in fact, a lot of the techniques that are now common in advertising today, you know why? when you're hearing about some product is it is are you hearing from some movie star that you might like why is it that voice well because you have associations with that voice you have positive associations with that voice and so if we connect our product with that voice which has positive associations those positive associations will transfer to the product so he brought classical conditioning into the world of advertising and did very well, um, but he did so because of this this affair, which caused him to lose his job. So, just kind of you know a powerful some a couple of these powerful stories throughout the history of psychology. Okay, so now let's go to Lashley. Um, I'm sorry, my PowerPoint is letting me do these weird design things on slides, and I can't help myself. This is the weirdest one so far. Uh, well, fragmented Carl Lashley there. Um, what do we want to tell you about Carl Ashley? It's kind of interesting. So Pavlov kind of came at things as a physiologist, and he ultimately informed something about psychology. Lashley wanted to do the other way around. He wanted to be a psychologist that was informing physiology. So he did a lot of work with animals who had learned, you know, through the sort of process we've described, some, some behaviors. Uh, and then he did ablation studies. So he tried to remove or damage parts of the brain. Um, and the question was, is there a certain part of the brain after an animal has learned something? If I remove that part of the brain, they don't know it anymore. So can we find the, the locus of the learning, you know, where it lives? And what they found is they couldn't. Um, it didn't matter what part of the brain. If they made small damages to the brain, they found very little um, negative effect at all. You would have to do major damage to the brain to see any effect. And once you did major damage, you saw effects on virtually every task. So they started to believe that things are not localized in the brain. Remember phrenology, the different parts of the brain? Well, Lashley and others started to argue that it's much more of a whole brain involved in everything. Um, so, uh, so they're using psychology to try to talk about how the brain works, physiology, kind of going backwards from where Pavlov did it. And, and Pavlov did not like this, by the way. <laughs> he was not, was not impressed with this approach at all. Um, I would just want to give you a taste of this. So here's um, Lashley's book um, where he talks about a lot of this. But this is the core point. What is the evidence that the cortex itself contains the definite specialized synapses which are demanded, demanded by the reflex theory? You know, take that as you will. But this is the small lesions either produce no symptoms or very transient ones. So that it is clear that the mechanism for habits are not closely grouped within small areas. We can't get rid of the habit by just doing a little one. When larger areas are involved, there's usually amnesias for many activities. Uh, yeah. Um, after injuries to the brain, the rate of formation of some habits is directly proportional to the extent of injury. So the more you injure the brain, the harder it is for the animal to learn new habits. Um, but again, the real core here is he's, he's, he's first of all using you know psychology to try to inform brain structure and how brain works, which is kind of interesting. Um, but also that he's not seeing evidence for localization of, of learning. 
of where those habits live. Um, you will see we see localization of function um, as you know things kind of trace out. We we believe more and more that certain functions are, are are located in certain parts of the brain. But when we go looking for where the learning ended up, it looks seems like the whole brain is involved in learning, or at least that's where we are at Lashley's point. Okay, so. That's the middle of uh, chapter nine. Um, I'm going to stop here and then we're going to come back and talk Skinner and then, then we'll be done with chapter nine.